My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 4, Aeschylus, The First Tragedies. Last time, we looked at the Athenian festival, the city Dionysia, which included the competition to decide the best tragic trilogy of the year. We saw how these plays grew out of religious ceremony, and particularly the Dithyram, performed by a chorus to praise the god Dionysus. The chorus then became the mouthpiece for retelling of myths, until the first actors stepped out onto what was to become the stage. The festival, including the competition, was a significant event in the civic life of Athens, as it found its place as the preeminent city-state in the Greek world. The theatre itself became central to the civic and political life, undergoing several periods of expansion and physical improvement through the 5th century BCE. The physical location of the theatre and the design of the building with the theatron, the orchestra and the skene had a significant impact on the works presented there. But now we need to step back a little from that apogee and look at the oldest works that we have on record, which include the earliest known works of the first great tragedian, Aeschylus. To set the scene a little, we know that the city Dionysia was established when Athens was under the rule of Pisistratus. He was born into a ruling aristocratic family and was popular in the city as a young man due to his military exploits. He briefly held power in 560 BCE but lost out in a power struggle with other city factions and spent some years in exile in northern Greece. There, he built a power base on the wealth generated by silver mining. These same silver mines were the primary source of Athenian wealth for many years, and there are many references to the silver in the land in several plays. Pisistratus launched a military attack on Attica, the eastern part of Greece, of the Greek mainland, close to Athens, in 546 BCE. He took a complete victory and became Tyrannos of Athens until he died in 527 BCE. Tyrannos meaning the master by use of force in a Greek definition. As such, he was a tough ruler while he established and strengthened his position, taking out rivals ruthlessly, but he saw the need to strengthen the unity of Athens as a fledgling polis, and over the years enacted many reforms to try to achieve this, including many religious and civic changes. It was in this context that he moved the Dionysia from the villages and into the city, and put it, and therefore the cult of Dionysus, under civic control through state sponsorship. The festival originally featured the performance of Dithyram, but from 534 BCE the performance of dramatic tragedy was included, and the drama competition created. References to the earliest pre-Aeschylus plays and poets are very scant, but we have some hints of a few. There's the semi-legendary Arian, who is credited with creating the Dithyram, turning the chorus into a disciplined unit, and introducing the call and response style, the strophe and antistrophe. Also, Corleus, who was born in 546 BCE, and is credited with staging 160 tragic plays, and scoring 13 victories at the festival in his 86 years. All his works are now lost. Pratinus was not a native of Athens, but was there in competition by 499 BCE. He's credited with having created the distinction between the tragedy and satire play that was to remain throughout the Greek period. The anecdote is that during one of his plays, the wooden seating at the theatre collapsed, causing much injury to the audience, perhaps not what he'd hoped to be remembered for. Another early playwright was Phrenicus. He was a pupil of Thespis and credited by some as the true creator of tragedy. He was victorious in the contest in 511 BCE and is best known for the play The Capture of Miletus that was presented shortly after the events that it depicted had occurred. The play deals with the Persian pacification of the city of Miletus during the Ionian Revolt, where Greek colonies in Asia Minor had risen up against the Tyrannos imposed on them by the Persian Empire. The audience in Athens were reportedly moved to tears, and the poet was fined a thousand drachma for reminding of familiar misfortunes, and, according to Herodotus, the play was banned for any future performance. 
It seems the Athenians were in no mood to be reminded that it was their neglect of the colony that allowed for the military defeat by their most feared and hated enemies. Phrenicus had more success in 476 BCE when he produced the Phoenician women, which was the model for Aeschylus's early play, The Persians, more of which in a moment. Phrenicus has also been credited with bringing in a lead actor, as distinct from the chorus leader, and introducing true dramatic dialogue. But from the scant evidence we have, it seems that these early tragedies were essentially lyric in their nature, with any dramatic element being very subordinate to this and the choral chant. And so to Aeschylus himself. Born about 525 BCE, he belonged to an aristocratic, wealthy landowning family from Eleusis, situated about 20 miles from Athens. The family were probably of the priestly clan that maintained the Eleusian mysteries. This cult was one of the most important in the city, and its sacred rites and objects were held in complete secrecy. The cult, which celebrated its rites related to the capture of Persephone, her removal to Hades for half a year and subsequent rescue, was already ancient by the 5th century BCE, having grown out of Mycenaean culture. As a member of this family, and with, at the very least, connections to the priestly class if not being an active member of it, Aeschylus would have benefited from much innate respect from Athenians. But it was said that he was prone to bouts of manic behaviour, and that he wrote while heavily intoxicated by wine. The cult had a reputation for the use of narcotics to promote visions, so perhaps this is just an extension of that expectation. Or perhaps he had an extreme artistic temperament that made him a difficult genius. We'll never know for sure. Sophocles said of him, He did what he ought, but he did it without knowing. Aeschylus was 26 when he had a play accepted to the Dionysia competition, at a time when Athens was on the cusp of its golden age. Following the death of the Tyrannos Pisistratus, his sons initially continued his reforms, but after one son was murdered, the rule became more despotic, and eventually the Spartans were encouraged to intervene and the Tyrannos was removed. Athens then began its move to become a democracy. All this when Aeschylus was in his late teens. Clearly, it made a significant impression on the young man. Pride in democracy is a theme throughout his work. Although he wrote about 90 plays, because all but seven of them are lost, it's not his dramatic output that dominates his life story from our perspective. Aeschylus was a soldier who fought in the significant battles of Marathon in 490 BCE and at Salamis ten years later. As a young-ish Athenian male, he would have been called up as part of his civic duty when the need arose. Between the Persian and Peloponnesian wars, this need was frequent. There's every indication that Athenians in general, and Aeschylus and his two brothers in particular, took this civic duty very seriously and proudly. You get the sense that it never crossed the mind of a young Athenian not to jump forward when the call came. The call up for the defence against the Persian invasion interrupted Aeschylus' dramatic career because it came at a time before actors were exempt from military service. So he became part of the infantry that was about to fight one of the most significant battles in history, And more specifically, he was part of the feared fighting unit of the day. He was a hoplite. Before this time, battles were usually skirmishes fought by aristocrats with private soldiers who could afford armour and horses, but Athens, as a democracy, had to be different. Where defence was needed, it came from the ranks of the demos. These were citizen soldiers who could afford their own kit and weapons, so mostly farmers, artisans and traders there was only a very small standing army that formed an elite corps. Once kitted out with a spear, a round shield, a sword and bronze armour, the hoplites drilled and trained to become a cohesive force in expectation of the call-up. As an infantry force, they used the phalanx formation so that every man protected the man on his left with the overlap of the shield. The technique was still used by the Romans and was the basis for the Anglo-Saxon shield wall in later times precisely because it was a very effective defence that still allowed for forward movement and attack. The concave shield, composed of leather, thick wood and bronze, was strong enough to stop arrows. The spear could be up to 14 feet long and was used as a thrusting rather than a throwing weapon. The sword, a secondary weapon to the spear, was short also a thrusting weapon. 
In this type of warfare, close hand-to-hand combat, there was room to stab, to shove, to push, but none for the swinging of a long sword. I briefly traced the build-up to the Battle of Marathon in the last episode, but to remind you, this is where the Persian king Darius had sworn revenge on Athens for supporting revolts by the Greek colonies in Asia Minor. On his second attempt to take that revenge, he sailed an army to the Cyclades in the Aegean and then progressed to the mainland and towards Athens. But the Athenians intercepted and the armies met on the fields of Marathon. The Athenians and their allies chose a location for the battle between marshes and mountainous terrain that prevented the Persian cavalry from joining the Persian infantry. The Persian forces, composed primarily of arrow-firing troops, were rendered ineffective by the hoplites' shields, and with reinforced flanks the Athenians surrounded the Persians' best fighters, enveloping them in an inward-wheeling motion. The Persian army broke in panic towards their ships, and large numbers were slaughtered. The defeat at Marathon marked the end of the first Persian invasion of Greece, and the Persian force retreated to Asia. Aeschylus lost a brother in the battle, but was singled out for his personal heroism, and later a painting was hung in the theatre in commemoration of his bravery. And he wasn't done with fighting yet. In 480 BCE, the Persians, now under Darius's son Xerxes, mounted another invasion. In response, the Athenians and their allies sent out a naval fleet to defend the Straits of Artemisium, and a land army to hold the pass at Thermopylae a natural bottleneck on the only land route a large army could take towards Athens. Aeschylus was likely to have been at the naval battle of Artemisium as a spearman on the 721-ship fleet. Over three days of armed attack and counter-attack, the losses on both sides were about equal, but the larger Persian fleet could afford them better. On the third day, news came of the defeat at Thermopylae. The Allied forces, and most famously a small Spartan contingent, had held the pass until being outflanked and overwhelmed by the much larger army. With their defensive strategy blown, the remains of the Athenian fleet withdrew to Salamis. Meanwhile, the Persians moved towards Attica. The Athenians just had time to abandon their city before it was sacked. At Salamis, the Athenian general Themistocles succeeded in luring the pursuing Persian navy into the narrow straits where the huge fleet became disorganised and trapped. They were soundly beaten, with many ships destroyed and heavy losses on the Persian side, compared to very few amongst the Athenians. The Allied victory at Salamis prevented a quick conclusion to the invasion, and fearing becoming trapped in Europe, Xerxes returned to Asia, but left an elite corps of his army to finish the invasion. When the populace returned to Athens, it had to be rebuilt, and this included the Theatre of Dionysus. It must have been an extremely hard time for the citizens. But not only was their democratic lifestyle maintained, it was made even more radical. The returning citizen army demanded more say in the running of the city. The men in the field and rowing the ships were of the Athenian working class, men who at this point did not have the right to vote. They argued that they had, after all, defended the land and defeated a much larger enemy, so deserved a proper place in society. The city agreed, and the franchise was extended. The people also learnt a lesson that became ingrained in their Athenianness. Yes, the city was important, but in their exile, they realised that they were Athenian because of their democracy and way of life, not because of where they lived. Some scholars argue that the expansion of Athenian influence that was about to happen, and of democracy itself, comes from this kernel of philosophy. But still, Aeschylus' military service was not over. In 481, Athens, with allies, amassed the largest ever hoplite army and marched north to confront the remaining Persian forces. At the Battle of Plataea, the Greek infantry again proved its superiority, inflicting a severe defeat on the Persians. On the same day, an allied navy destroyed the remains of the Persian fleet at the Battle of Mycelae. With this double defeat, the invasion was ended. Persian power in the Aegean was severely dented. Within three years, they were exiled completely from Europe. Aeschylus put his military experience to extensive use in his earliest known play, The Persians. This play is the second part of an otherwise lost trilogy that won the first prize at the Dionysia in 472 BCE. 
Its subject is the Battle of Salamis, a surprisingly contemporary tale for Greek drama, being performed just eight years after the events themselves. Although he clearly has inspiration from personal experience, he also borrows from Phrenicus and the aforementioned Phoenician women, presented four years earlier. The play takes place in Susa, one of the capitals of the Persian Empire, and opens with a choral ode sung by the chorus as old men of the city, who lament the gap in society left when the young men are away at war. They're joined by the Queen Mother, Atossa, who waits for news of her son Xerxes and his expedition against the Greeks. Showing all her anxiety and unease, Atossa narrates what may be the first dream sequence in European theatre. A messenger arrives and gives a graphic description of the Battle of Salamis and its gory outcome. He tells of the Persian defeat, reciting the names of the Persian generals who have been killed, and that Xerxes has escaped and is returning. The climax of the messenger's speech is his rendition of the battle cry of the Greeks as they charged. On, sons of Greece, set free your fatherland, set free your children, wives, places of your ancestral gods and tombs of your ancestors. Forward for all. At the tomb of her dead husband Darius, Atossa asks the chorus to summon his ghost and tells him of the Persian defeat. Darius is outraged and condemns the hubris behind his son's decision to invade Greece. The ghost prophesies another Persian defeat at the Battle of Plataea. Where the plain grows lush and green, where Asopus' stream plumps rich Boeotia's soil, the mother of disasters awaits them there, reward for insolence, for scorning God. The ghost departs, and Xerxes arrives dressed in shredded robes that denote his defeat. Atossa says, Grief swarmed, but worst of all it stings to hear how my son, my prince, wears tattered rags. The remainder of the play consists of the king alone with the chorus, engaged in a lyrical lament that bemoans the enormity of Persia's defeat in the Greek victory. Aeschylus is using several clever theatrical devices here to bring out the tragic elements of the play. The setting is the Persian court, and the events are told from the Persian perspective. This immediately makes it exotic and removed from Athenian life, but more significantly, it's the revelation of the Persian emotions, their anxieties, their horror and shame at the defeat, their grief, that makes the play a tragedy. Told from the Athenian perspective, Salamis is a great victory and no tragedy. But this switch of perspective means that the audience have to have some detachment, if not sympathy, for the Persians to appreciate it as a tragedy. There may also be a more prosaic reason for the setting. There was a restriction on naming and showing living Athenians in plays, so telling the story from the Athenian perspective would have been difficult without creating fictional characters, and that just doesn't seem to have been something that was considered as appropriate in Greek theatre. Using real-life Persian characters held no such limitations, of course. And let's not forget that a good portion of the audience would have been involved in the battles with the Persians only a few years ago. Some were probably carrying injuries sustained or grieving for their lost fathers, sons and comrades. Because of the democratic nature of the army, every citizen would have been affected by loss of some sort. And they were still living in a city being rebuilt after the atrocity of the sack by the Persian army. Presenting the play in this way from the Persian perspective was a bold move. The atmosphere must have been electric, even dangerously tense, as the audience wondered where this was going. The play opens with the choral ode, there's no prologue here, and although the chorus are the old men of Susa, the metre of the ode is very militaristic. It has a da-da-da, 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 Meter, and I think it's easy to imagine the chorus entering at a slow march along the paradoi and setting the military and sombre tone. Among the audience, drilling and marching would have been very familiar and recognisable even when performed by the Persian enemy. The sea battle itself, as reported by the messenger, is a blistering eyewitness account of the Greek success from the Persian perspective. The horror of war is laid out for all to hear and imagine, but there's no glorification in the victory. This is from the heart of the sea battle. 
then from our side swelled up the mangled din of Persian tongues. And time brooked no delay, ship unto ship drove hard its brazen beak, with speed of thought and shattering blow. And first one Grecian bark plunged straight and sheared away bowsprit to stern of Persian ship. And then each galley on some other's prow came crashing in. A while our stream of ships held onward, till within the narrowing creek our jostling vessels were altogether driven, and none could aid another. Each on each drove hard their brazen beaks, or break away the oar banks of each other, stem to stern, while the Greek galleys, with no lack of skill, hemmed them and battered them in their sides. And soon the hulls rolled over, and the sea was hid, crowded with wrecks and butchery of men. No beach nor reef was with corpses strewn, and every keel of our barbarian host hurried to flee in utter disarray. Thereon the foe closed of in upon the wrecks, and hacked and hewed with oars and splintered planks, as fishermen hack tuna fish, or a cast of netted dolphins, and the briny sea rang with the screams and shrieks of dying men. Until the night's dark aspect hid the scene. Had I ten days' time to sum the count of carnage, it would be too little. Know this well, one day never saw such myriad forms of death. Although the play is still largely a work for the chorus, and there's little dramatic action, there are moments when actors come to the fore. As well as the messenger's speech, the anguish of the Queen is powerful. This could be early evidence of characterisation coming into the dramas. Atossa's lament must have had a striking effect in performance. She's tormented by the messenger listing the fallen generals, waiting and waiting to hear her son's name, and finally cries out, Who has not fallen? The lament for the dead was the preserve of women in Athenian society and was viewed cautiously by the male city leaders. This was the realm of unfettered emotion and went against the idea of rational justice and democracy that the city stood for. The Queen's outpouring of emotion, remorse and the call for revenge must have caused some discomfort to the male audience. We also have very early use of a ghost in a play. What is particularly clever is that the use of the ghost allows Aeschylus to foreshadow and predict the outcome of the Battle of Plataea and the total destruction of the Persian army, which is still in the future of the now of the play. The moral lessons are clear. Xerxes is an autocrat who through his own hubris insults the gods. The attack on Athens is an outrage and that outrage is religious and political through the attempt to overthrow democracy, the demos and the polis and thereby insulting the gods. But the play is also a boast about the Athenian victory, however skewed the viewpoint. Some scholars have argued that the play gives a somewhat sympathetic view of the Persians, and although it's true that much Greek tragedy contains a dual viewpoint for the audience to consider, I think in this case it's difficult to see it as anything than celebratory and bursting with pride at the Athenian victory over this monumental enemy, especially given the proximity of the events and Aeschylus' own involvement in them. But the celebration is tempered. Aeschylus seems to be saying to the Athenians, see yourself here. Beware of hubris. We are in the ascendant now, but see what we could become if we don't protect our democracy. In the Persians, we see Aeschylus flexing his creative muscles to produce a work that is powerful in scale through the use of large characters and the portrayal of intense emotions. It's a form he went on to use later in the Oristia, so it's difficult now not to see the Persians as a testing ground for that later much more successful work. But there was certainly a significant lesson that he did take away. The Persians was a controversial play and had a mixed reception. It seems that Athenians didn't want their drama contemporary, so right at the beginning of this golden age of tragedy we have the last of the overtly contemporary Greek plays. And from here on in, the poet's message for the city in the present was delivered through the familiar myths of the long past. Aeschylus died in 456 BCE, aged about 69. He was then living in exile in Syracuse on the island of Sicily. The exact details of his crimes are now lost to us, but it seems that he was prosecuted for revealing too much detail of the Eleusinian mysteries. Legend has it that he died when a bird mistook his bald head for a rock 
and dropped a tortoise on it to break its shell. This is fairly typical of Greek black humour, so probably not true. But the epitaph on his gravestone says more of the man. There's no mention of his plays and his huge success as a poet of the theatre. It says, Aeschylus, the Athenian, Euphorian's son, is dead. This tomb in Gala's wheatlands covers him. His glorious valour the hallowed fields of Marathon could tell, and the long-haired Persians have knowledge of it. The epitaph is thought to be contemporary to his death, so he, or a family member who commissioned the gravestone, wanted Aeschylus to be remembered for two things, being Athenian and being a soldier. In the Persians, we see the themes and world view that Aeschylus was to take forward into his later plays. He was a religiously conservative patriot who believed passionately in democracy. It was a passion forged in the heat of battle that he knew so well, but he was also a poet who could paint with words of rich imagery and metaphor. He's seen as less subtle than his successors, but he is the launching pad for those who came after him, and in his best moments, his ability to take the huge theme down to the human level is unsurpassed. Next time, we continue with the work of Aeschylus, as we take a detailed look at his great work, The Oresteia. As the only surviving complete trilogy, it holds a special place in the Greek pantheon for us. But it is a great work, perhaps a masterpiece in its own right. So like the Watchmen of Argos, keep a sharp eye out for the next episode. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp@gmail.com at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.